Welcome to Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast, brought to you by Nickel Investigations, the podcast that delves deep into the unsolved mysteries that haunt our province. I'm Jay Nickel, a private investigator with Nickel Investigations, and your host and guide in this journey through the chilling tales that left investigators baffled in communities in search of answers. In each episode, we'll unearth the forgotten stories of Ontario's cold cases, exploring the details, the evidence, and the individuals involved with the eye of a private investigator who specializes in cold case investigations. From the mysterious disappearances to the perplexing murders, our mission is to shine a light in these cases and hopefully bring justice to those who have long awaited closure. But we can't do it alone. Join us as we navigate the twists and turns of these enigmatic cases. We'll speak with experts, law enforcement officials, and sometimes even the families of the victims, all in the pursuit of truth. So buckle up and prepare to dive headfirst into the world of unresolved mysteries. Together we'll keep the flame of hope burning for justice one episode at a time. Thank you for tuning in to the Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast. Let's begin our quest for answers. Hello, I'm Jay Nickel of Nickel Investigations and the host of Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast. Series 2, episode 13, on the murder of Adela Komorowski. Adela Komorowski was a 26-year-old McMaster University graduate student near the completion of her thesis. In 1972, she worked toward her master's in German languages and literature. It was a small department, about 10 graduate students and fewer faculty. On Tuesday, May 15, 1973, with her 27th birthday in two weeks, she met a girlfriend for coffee. She was attractive and popular among staff and students. Felt safe on campus. One female student often slept overnight in her graduate office. Adela was at her desk on the fifth floor working on her thesis until about 11 p.m. Adela picked up her purse and umbrella. She left an unfinished passage on the page. She walked into the darkness, lit by a full moon, to the end of her story. Adela Komorowski was murdered on the evening of May 15, 1973. She was dragged in the woods behind Brandon Hall, a Mac residence in an area known as Coots Paradise. The 26-year-old was strangled, her body tied with carefully knotted rope. Up next, Adela's early life. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Adela's Early Life Michael Komorowski grew up in the dangerous times in the 1920s in Belarus. His family fled the Soviet Union under Stalin and ended up in Germany during the rise of Hitler. Shipped to a forced labor camp for immigrants. That's where he met his future wife, Helen. In 1947, they had a child, Adela. They left the ruins of post-war Germany for Australia and in 1951, Canada when Adela was four. They settled in Cooksville near Mississauga. Her father insisted Adela learn English, but he spoke Russian in the house and her mother German, and her grandparents living under the same roof, Polish. Adela picked up all four languages. Her brother Peter was born in 1956. She was protected of him and assumed a motherly role when their parents' marriage fell apart. She was closest to her father, who worked as a truck driver, who insisted his kids work hard in school and have a better life than he had. Adela enrolled at McMaster University, ultimately studying languages, focusing on German. She lived on Main Street West with her boyfriend, Walter Kubrin. They met work in the same summer job and she convinced him to go back to school. He too was born in Germany, where his Ukrainian parents had been forced to work in a munitions factory. Adela had a chameleon aura, tall with dark hair and dark eyes. Sometimes she wore high boots and scarves, fashionable yet understated. She was outgoing and confident, soft-spoken and reserved. Perhaps she was what others wanted to see. Classmates like her parents pronounced her name Adela, closer to the German pronunciation with its more lyrical sound. It fit. 
Friends were drawn to her and men pursued her, including one of her professors. In 1972, she worked towards her master's in German languages and literature. It was a small department, about 10 graduate students and fewer faculty. Adela won a scholarship to study in Germany for a year. She moved out of her apartment with Walter. He hated the thought of her leaving, afraid it would doom their relationship. His fears were realized. Overseas, she met a German naval lieutenant and they became engaged. At McMaster in the Arts II building, where graduate students worked, she kept the photo of her fiancé on her desk. She told friends the wedding date was set for July. On Tuesday, May 15, 1973, with her 27th birthday in two weeks, she met a girlfriend for coffee. A classmate stopped by the table, Alfred Petzold. He just turned 38 but looked younger, tall and fit with sharp features. Disdainful of hippie culture, he had a formal manner. The rare student wore a jacket and tie. He'd emigrated from Germany to Canada, moved around, studied at more than one university, spent time in the Canadian Navy. He was into hiking and mountain climbing. He told Adela that the next morning he had a job interview to teach at a high school in Guelph. He had briefly dated her. They got into arguments. He had a chauvinistic attitude, and Adela did not let anyone walk over her. A friend of Adela's felt he had an Aryan superiority complex. He's too high and mighty, Adela said. Later that afternoon, she spoke with a classmate named Mike Hammond. He said if she worked late, she could stay at his place in the Brandon Hall residence, as she'd done in the past. It was about a seven-minute walk from the Arts II building. She said she might take him up on his offer. The residence was at the north end of campus, hard against trails popular with students that wound into Coots Paradise. Felt safe on campus. One female student often slept overnight in her graduate office. Adela was at her desk on the fifth floor working on her thesis. Adela worked intently for hours. This was the last paper of her university career. In a few weeks, she'd be flying to Germany where she would be married. Only a few of her friends knew the ensuing ceremony, and one of them was planned to make sure it never happened. At about 10.30 p.m., a voice stopped Adela's writing in mid-sentence. The man in the doorway wanted to talk. He had no intention of losing her to her German fiancé, and Adela had no intention of letting her stop him. They agreed, and then as suddenly as he came, he disappeared. Adela was shaken and sat at her desk a long while, not being able to work. At 11.10, she decided to go back to her room in Brandon Hall for the night. The day had been cool and it rained, but the night sky cleared. Adela picked up her purse and umbrella. She left an unfinished passage on the page. She was sharing a room with another student who, about the same time as Adela left her office, looked out his bedroom window and noticed that the light in Adela's office was out. He expected her back shortly. Fifteen minutes later, she was dead, her half new body trussed up and white in the darkness of Coot's Paradise. Up next, the investigation. The Investigation. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Incredibly, there was a witness to the attack. At about 11 o'clock on the night of Adela's death, another student was reading in her bed on the sixth floor of Brandon Hall. At 11.15, she heard a woman scream. With her light out, she peered down through a strand of trees which had not yet got their full foliage. At first, she only heard the voices of Adela and her attacker. Then they came into view. Adela's attacker dragged her by the wrist. Adela pulled back but with surprisingly little resistance. She was being drawn along a pathway parallel to the front of Brandon Hall and toward a wooded footpath that led into Coot's Paradise. Adela's attacker seemed taller than Adela and looked as though he had short curly hair. He was young and slender and wore a dark waist-length leather coat with a belt at the waist. As around the corner and headed into the woods, Dela shouted, Leave me alone, please, leave me alone. Just as he disappeared into the night, the witness heard the sounds of a scuffle and thought she heard Adela being punched while she was crying and pleading. But those sounds were confused and muffled, and then there was silence. The witness looked out her window and saw a cluster of people picking some objects off the ground in front of the main entrance. She left her room and dashed to the elevator, trying to get to the front desk to report what she had seen. 
She got to the main floor. She saw a few students standing around the reception desk. Adela's purse, umbrella, sweater, and one sandal were on the counter in front of them. At a quarter to twelve, two McMaster security guards were winding their way up a pathway leading from the shore of Coots Paradise to Brandon Hall. Ten minutes earlier, they received a call from the receptionist in Brandon Hall. A girl being grabbed and dragged to the path they were now on. With five, within five minutes, they were on the scene. Three hundred feet down the path, Adela's attacker stood over her now still body. He could easily see the red light from the cruiser and hear the crackle of the radios. A few minutes after he caused Adela to scream, he left her body fifty feet from the edge of the path and ran deeper into the woods. The position in which Adela's body was later to be found made it clear that her killer had not completed his crime when he fled from the activity at the head of the path. But 100 feet along the trail, one security guard found a bronze sweater lying in the dirt. He picked them up and stuffed them in his pocket. Then the two security guards took the path all the way to the water's edge and turned around, probing the woods with their flashlights. So he headed back, another security guard began down the top of the path. Just as the three met, a flashlight picked up a white object about 50 feet off to the west of the trail. The guard slid down the incline that led from the path to the object and discovered it was Adela's body. It was still warm, but there was no sign of life. She was lying on her back with her bloodied head downhill. Her face was blue and there was a clot of blood in the open eye that could be seen. Half her face was covered by a blue J-cloth. She was wearing nothing but a pair of blue jeans which were unfastened and pulled down halfway between her knees and crotch. There was a sandal on her left foot. Numerous scratches ran the length of Adela's body from her breast to her knees. She'd been brutally garroted. Quarter-inch rope was wrapped around her throat three times and embedded itself so deeply into her skin that at first the security guards thought her throat had been slashed. Her arms had been yanked up behind her neck in a full Nelson and the rope ran between them and her neck. Her hair was a mess of dirt and leaves, and her face was swollen and bruised. The next f morning, her father would not recognize her. At 11.47, when the d they discovered the body, the guards radioed for police assistance. When the police arrived, they brought tracking dogs with them. The dogs picked up a trail that led down to a parking lot west of Coots Drive. But the rain had lifted the oil on the tarmac, and with it, any hint of a scent had floated away. The dogs quickly reach a dead end. At midnight, two Hamilton police detectives stood in the woods over the victim's body. She lay on her back off the trail on the downslope. One footprint was found a wooden bridge that spanned a stretch of shoreline swamp. They were already playing catch-up. A half hour had expired from the emergency call from campus security to, to the detectives arriving. They never got a clean look at the scene. Police trying to help walked over the area and picked up clothing items. She had been dragged along the trail, a hemp rope was wrapped around her neck three times and also her wrists, pinning her arms behind her head. The more she struggled, the tighter it would become. A blue J-cloth was stuffed in her mouth. She had died from strangulation. The knots of bound Adela were expertly tied and for the first time revealed that the rope used in Adela contained traces of horse and cow hair. About this time a Mayfair Crescent, a quiet residential street that leads to the woods of Coots Paradise, a young woman, was startled by the sudden appearance of a man who jumped into a dark green Volkswagen and sped away leaving his car lights out. About 2 a.m., Adela's watch was found. It was damaged and had stopped at 12.09. One of the police or security guards had stepped on it. Police measured 300 feet, about 90 meters, from the body to the front of Brandon Hall. The killer had come prepared and acted quickly. Forty police officers searched along with tracking dogs. A witness told police what she saw from a room on the sixth floor of the residence. At 11.15 p.m., she heard a woman yell, Leave me alone. She rushed to the window and saw a man over six feet tall speaking with a woman by the lights of the building. Man, then the man led her out of view towards the woods and the woman screamed, Please let me go. Please don't hurt me. The witness, who was attending a library science conference, yelled, Leave her alone. Another witness told police at about 11 p.m. he and his son were walking towards the Commons building when they noticed a heavy-set man sitting on a nearby, nearby bench. He had frizzy dark hair and was wearing glasses and a dark nylon jacket. Later they saw him leaning up against a wall near the Commons building. 
The man and son left the area moments before Adela arrived. Weeks later, they would pick out the man they saw that night from an array of photos the police put in front of them. Police learned the name of the victim was Adela Komorowski, and that her friend Mike Hammond was in the residence. At 3 a.m., detectives took him to the morgue to identify the body. He admired Adela, felt that as lovely as she was, she was an even nicer person. Now he watched the sheet peel back. The image stayed with him forever. He headed to a friend's apartment beside himself in tears. Police interviewed anyone connected with her. A friend said that two days earlier, Adela was in a heated argument with a man. She was overheard saying, No, I won't. Who had motive? Who could tie elaborate knots, knowing there was little time after she screamed, and so close to the residence? Up next, the investigation continues. The investigation continues. A daily beam found with her top off and pants down below her hips. A bra was found nearby, but not her size. Postmortem examination showed she had not been sexually assaulted or raped. I had the pants slid down from her being dragged. Detectives soon began to search Adela's room for anything that might help them. Adela had a fair bit of clothing in her room with the exception of panties. She never wore them, which made it clear why none were found at the scene of her murder. Weeks later, the bra that was found on the path would become one of the great enigmas of the case, but as the detectives searched Adela's room, its importance was not apparent. Detectives examining evidence came to the bra that had been found at the murder scene. It stuck them as a terribly small bra for a girl of Adela's build to wear. Looking at two other bras they had found in an overnight bag that Adela kept, they noticed they were both delicate, trimmed with lace, and both the same size. The bra they found on the path, on the other hand, was four inches smaller and seemed more the practical garment an older woman would wear. The paint in the middle class of the bra was worn off, so the wearer must have been comfortable in it. It seemed clear the bra found at the scene of the murder was not Adela's. It appeared that Adela's killer had switched her bra with one that he had brought with him. Police spent the day after the murder trying to determine where the j cloth and rope had also come from. The rope was ordinary, quarter-inch hemp, the type would have been used in tents or awnings. On the McMaster grounds near the running track, the detectives examined the guy ropes that held up a tent used for a track and field event. The rope used seemed the same, but no rope was missing from the tent. However, workmen said that there had been another tent on the site the previous day, the tent had been only a few hundred yards from where Adela's body was found. The detectives could find no facility on campus at Stock Blue J Class. The story filled pages of the Hamilton Spectator the next day. Campus killer hunted after woman strangled. Later, police found a piece of information had been overlooked. The witness who had seen the attack from a window mentioned she thought she saw the man who had dragged Adele away answer a ringing payphone in the lobby. Checking through the interviews done with residents of Brandon Hall, the detectives found that a man named Robert told the police that he had answered the payphone. Shortly before 11 p.m. the night of Adela's death, Robert was walking from Brandon Hall over to Arts 2. He was hungry and was heading to the Phoenix, a campus pub for a sandwich. He decided to get to the pub via the Arts Building's underground halls and tried to open the door to Arts 2. It was locked, but as Robert pulled it, a girl with a sweater over her shoulders appeared around a corner but inside the building and opened it for him. It was Adela, and as Robert watched, he headed for Brandon Hall. When he got to the pub, he found out he couldn't get a sandwich because it was after 11 p.m. and the kitchen was closed. He made his way back to his residence, only to find a group of people gathered around the reception desk. The payphone was ringing. When he picked it up, the caller asked for one of the students in the residence. Robert called out the name, but no one answered. Robert was a divorcee up from California to, suffer, to do study political science. The detectives could find nothing unusual in his background, and after interviewing him, concluded he was anxious to help the police and unlikely to have any reason to kill Adela. Rumors spread on campus. What had Adela been doing in Germany, West Germany, at the height of the Cold War? Had she spied for the Soviets and KGB agents killed her? 
or the Russian mafia, the Germans, up next, the suspects. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations, The Suspects. Adela's fiancé was not a suspect. He had been in Germany. Her father was questioned, but he too lacked opportunity. There were police notes on other people of interest. The first, an undergraduate student Adela taught. He was in love with her, psychological issues, not sexually normal. Lacked opportunity, read the police notes. He quit at the beginning of the year and had been a bit of a problem. He talked about committing suicide and being under psychiatric care. He worked at a ball bearing plant in St. Thomas and in the day after the murder spoke about it to a workmate. The father and son who'd seen a man leaning up against the wall of the commons would pick out the man they saw that night from an array of photos the police put in front of them. Both were sure it was the undergraduate student. However, it was later determined that he had in fact been at home the night of the 15th. Second suspect is Professor Robert Van Dusen. Again, the police notes read, 44, single, small build, meek demeanor, nicknamed Whispering Bob, for how quietly he spoke in class. Infatuated with a student, Adela, served in the U.S. Army, including counterintelligence in Germany from 1951 to 1954. Clive Paul ultimately became lead officer on the case. He believed the professor was a strong suspect. A woman said he had basically stalked Adela. Even though she rebuffed him, she saw him on occasion socially, fueling rumors she manipulated him. The Volkswagen she'd been driving was his. Adela's car of Volkswagen was parked in her father's garage. Searching her car, detectives found in the gloved compartment a bill of sale. Adela purchased a car for $200 from the Mac professor, Robert Van Dusen. Most of Adela's friends tend to believe that she was the darling of the German department. Adela's close friend was particularly intrigued by the relationship that Adela had with the professor. The professor had Adela as a student her second year and then again her final year. Quickly became obvious to Adela's friends the professor was taken with her. They felt the professor was secretly in love with Adela. For a time, Adela lived in the same apartment building as the professor. He would watch her and time her comings and goings so that he could meet her. Friends heard stories the professor was known to slip love notes under Adela's door. He had dated Adela on at least one occasion when they went to the ballet in Toronto. There seemed no doubt that the passion in the relationship only flowed one way. Adela used a professor. She tended to manipulate all of her professors, playing up to them, complimenting them on their ties, going for the A+. But in Van Dusen's case, she had used his affections for her own ends. In the professor's apartment, police found a piece of rope in a U.S. Army duffel bag, a different type than the one used in Adela. Van Dusen had taught Adela on the day she was murdered. Later in the afternoon, he went to her room in Arts 2 and offered her a bibliographic reference he thought would help with the paper she was preparing for him. He left Mac at about 6 worked out at the YMCA and went home, leaving his apartment only once around 9.30 p.m. to buy some food before retiring for the evening. He was interrogated by Detective Jim Willis. It started out cordially, and then he gave them the full treatment. When it was over, the detective believed he was not the killer, but others still considered him a suspect. He knew Adela's study habits, her route home, and was familiar with the woods behind the campus. He was also an avid camper with good knowledge of knots and ropes. Colleagues in the German department were outraged at how he was treated by police. Bob Van Dusen, of all people. Van Dusen died in 2007 at Joe Brandt Hospital and was buried in his family plot in New York City. A more humble, benevolent gentleman would be hard to find where it is obituary. He taught part-time at McMaster until 1994. The next suspect is Alfred Eric Petzold. Police notes read, classmate, 38, six foot three, sexually normal, involved with many women in his life. Claims he was home at the time of the killing, but there is no corroboration. 
Alfred was boarding with a German family in Emerson Street, only a quarter mile from the McMaster campus. Two weeks before Adela's murder, he'd arrived in Hamilton, having just completed the world tour. He attended Mac two, two years earlier, and had shared a desk with Adela. The day Adela was murdered, he had coffee with her in the late afternoon. Alfred Petzold said that he had been down in the ravine the night Adela was killed, but he arrived home about 11.15 p.m. Alfred Petzold told friends police would come for him, and they did, searching his home in Emerson Street, and asked him to hand over clothes he'd been wearing the night of the murder. After the interview, the detectives took him to Mayfair Crescent and walked him to an area near the track and field grounds, where Alfred pointed out a pathway that led down to Coots Paradise in a northeast direction. He said he'd come straight to that spot from Emerson and ended up at the children's garden further east. He didn't see or speak to anyone and got home at about 11.15 p.m. Detectives took him over to the South Shore Trail, about 1,000 feet west of where he entered the woods, but very close to where Adela's body was found. When he tried to get him to walk down the path, Petzl refused to take the trail, saying that he had not gone that way at all. He offered to take a lie detector test, but the next day his lawyer said he would not. They interviewed his supervisor from the Canadian military, said he had a solid record, but seemed to feel superior to others. Detectives found it curious that Petzl claimed to have heard of the murder in the afternoon of May 16th, but he didn't tell anyone he was in Coots Paradise on the night Adela was killed until the 17th. It also struck the detectives as odd that Petz, Petzold didn't call the police to offer his assistance, even though he had seen Adela the day she was killed and claimed to be in the area of her murder just prior to it happening. They felt that Alfred had read the newspaper account of the murder and saw there to be at least one eyewitness. Realizing he may have been seen, he tried to establish credibility by saying he'd been in the ravine the night of the murder. Precious days passed, the investigation in disarray with many officers involved and information poorly coordinated. The next suspect is Walter Kubrin. Police reports 28, six foot four, third year sociology student, serious boyfriend until they broke up. Friend told Walter Kubrin the news. He was shaken. Friend said investigators would want to speak to him. Walter agreed and walked into the police station. I hear you might be looking for me, he said. In the room chilled like a meat locker, detectives hurled questions and accusations at him, then switched to a stifling hot room and continued. They threatened to show him pictures of Adela from the morgue. I don't want to see that. I don't want to remember her like that, Walter said, as they made him look. In October, with suspects discounted or on the back burner, detectives Paul and Willis flew to Halifax to take another run with one they believed was their man, Walter Kubrin. Adela's former boyfriend, married, and moved out east to attend university in graduate social work. Had he left Ontario to escape attention from police? He was, Clyde Paul noted, an expert sailor and perhaps proficient in knot tiling. Plus, he had grown a full beard for the first time after the murder, and his wife was Zalibi, which was the worst alibi in the world, to borrow a quote from F. Lee Bailey, U.S. Attorney. The detectives put him through the ringer for a second time, more than four hours of interrogation, using every ploy in the book. But when they finished, they knew their hunch was wrong. They no longer believed he had the window of opportunity to commit the crime. Moreover, they learned he'd applied to study out east one month prior to the murder. Walter Kubrin didn't do it, and now they were sure. The next suspect, an unknown stranger, the police notes read, a sexually misfitted psychopathic type could be the killer. His motive, one of thrill killing. Will the killer strike again? Pressure mounting to crack the case, police grilled two additional suspects and both gave false confessions. The next suspect, Robert Garrow. On August 14th, Clive Paul received information from a New York State trooper that put a new suspect on the radar. Robert Garrow. A serial rapist and spree killer had recently been captured in the Adirondack Mountains and jailed in Hamilton County, New York. Two months after the murder of Adela in the Adirondacks in Upper New York State, Robert Garrow was a subject of a massive manhunt after a spree of vicious murders involving binding victims with careful knots. the time of Adela's murder, Garrow lived in Syracuse, New York, a four-hour drive from Hamilton. 
In July, he killed two women and two men, strangling one and stabbing the others. A New York State Police investigator wrote, Garrow's modus operandi has been to accost his victim, take them to a secluded area which is usually heavily wooded and swampy, rape and or sexually abuse them, sometimes while tiled up and sometimes not. Sometimes the victim has been killed and sometimes released. His killings have been stabbings. The rope used in a daily contained traces of horse and cow hair. That details of interest given Garrow's farm farming background. However, Garrow was known to cut the rope off his victims and take it with him. In correspondence with Hamilton Police, a New York State Police official said a map was found in Garrow's Volkswagen with notations made next to a dozen cities. This is a New York State map but does include Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on it. Next to Hamilton, Ontario is a pencil question mark. The map of Robert Garrow's orange Volkswagen had 27 dots on it. Inspector Henry McCabe found the document in Garrow's abandoned car. It was 1973 in summer coming to the Adirondacks. McCabe, a detective with the New York State Police, was part of the 200-person manhunt combing the scenic mountains for Garrow, who had just savagely murdered a rope-bound camper. Garrow will become the state's most infamous serial killer, charged with the death of four people, and suspected of many murders and rapes. A witness in Hamilton reported seeing a Volkswagen speed away in Westdale with its lights off an hour after Adele is murdered. A New York State Police investigator noted that in conversation, Garrow seemed to indicate that he had crossed the Peace Bridge into Ontario in the past, but was no more specific than that, and he flared up when asked about the map which he denied was his, and accused police of planting it. New York State Police said they had no objection to Hamilton detectives interviewing Garrow, but that Garrow's lawyer had shut down further interviews with police. In 2012, Medela's brother, Peter Komarowski, was contacted by Jim Tracy, a writer in New York State, researching a book about the killer Robert Garrow. He told Peter he believed Garrow may have murdered Adela, that the circumstances surround the homicide were eerily reminiscent of Garrow's crimes. Peter never heard Garrow's name and called Hamilton police. That in turn led the homicide unit to revisit the case with Staff Sergeant Dave Olinock carrying the file. The detectives visited the scene in the woods, retrieved case boxes from stores to review notes and photos and organized material according to their major case management system. He did not ask retired detectives for their opinion, not until he was finished. Forensic evidence, to the extent they had any, had already been tested to little effect. The rope, handled by multiple people without gloves under different protocols in 1973, being retested in 2002, an insufficient quantity of DNA was found. He completed his report in September. He hypothesized that the scene was staged to resemble a rape attempt to make the attack seem random and confuse investigators. Hamilton Police Detective Clyde Paul said that Garrow's possible involvement could explain one of the oddest aspects of the case. The, brown, the bra found near Komorowski's body was not hers. Her girlfriend told her it was too small for Adela and was a style worn by a much older woman, explains Paul. Retired detective said at the time he and his partner could make any sense of it. But now the serial killer is their best suspect. It fits together. He could have taken it as a trophy from an earlier rape or murder and left it, Paul says. But it could have also been part of the theorized staged rape attempt and was all the attacker had available to him and never considered the size being in style being wrong. Up next, my theory. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. My theory. While Robert Garrow is a strong suspect, there is one glaring difference from Garrow's other crimes. If it was Garrow, he would have raped Adela. Garrow was known to use the rouse of being a plainclothes detective and at least one occasion brandished what appeared to be a handgun and badge. It certainly would explain why Adela did go to the woods with Garrow if it was indeed him. 
However, it does seem likely that Adela knew her killer. But if Adela knew her attacker, why would she have left her purse behind? Why wouldn't she have made the assailant wait while she picked it up and her umbrella and sweater up? Also, whoever grabbed her would have had to be a strong man and one familiar with knots, like a sailor or a camper. It's obvious that the crime was not carefully thought out. The killer was enormously lucky not to have been seen grabbing Adela in front of Brandon Hall. The man and his son left the area only moments before Adela was grabbed, and the students had picked up her purse, umbrella, and sandal arrived moments later. The Hamilton Police Service website says Adela Komorowski was seen being accosted by a male outside of Brandon Hall and heard to scream, Leave me alone. She was dragged into the woods. The commotion attracted the attention of other residents and the search of the area quickly commenced. A short time later, her body was covered near a path in the woods. Considering the terrain in the area of the woods and the apparent quick response of both residents and police, it seems likely it was someone who knew the area well. This does not apply to Robert Garrow, at least to what we know of him. The prime suspect who emerged is one who had somehow faded from view in the investigation. The suspect, originally from Germany, matches the description of the witness, was a misogynist, Dela Dela, and being rejected by her. He had a confrontation with her a couple days prior to the murder and on the day itself, this having, after having recently learned of her engagement to the German naval lieutenant. The suspect told the police he walked the trails in the general area of the murder that night, which perhaps was a preemptive move to get out in front of witness statements if he'd been spotted. He told a friend that someone stole rope from his apartment. Conversations with a professor, he kept referring to Adela as this girl, which was odd, oddly detached phrasing. A year after the murder, he returned to his native Germany and never came back to Canada. He was an odd and arrogant character, and Oloniak wrote in his report in which he redacted the names of the suspects. Adela was an independent woman who had no problem confronting the men in her life. She was known to be assertive, and this, in 1973, could have easily been seen to trigger a disproportionate response from a jealous male. It is my belief that Adela was murdered by someone that she knew that the scene was staged to add a non-existent sexual component. I believe that the culprit is Alfred Petzold. As for Alfred Petzold, there is nothing more to investigate. Even as DNA could be found on the rope, it could never be matched. Police say their return has closed him in 1973 or had them destroyed a long time ago. Moreover, there are no blood relations to test. Aloniak searched for Petzold. There is no record of him ever marrying or having children. He has no known relatives. The detectives recently connected with the police in Germany and learned that Alfred Petzold died in, 19, two, sorry, in 2005 at the age of 70. Police never shut the door on receiving information about an unsolved homicide, but is essentially case closed. Up next, Never Forgotten. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Never forgotten. By the 1990s, police withdrew the offer of reward money for information on the case. It entered the peculiar realm of historical homicides. In 2006, a play was even staged about it in the same building where Adela worked on her thesis. Her mother died young. Alcoholism put her down that road and her daughter's murder accelerated the in inevitable. Her father, being a distant hard man, cried every time he talked about Adela. Over the years, he would check in with police for updates, but there was never anything to report. He held out hope someone would be charged right up until he died at the age of 87. Former classmates said Adela's murder never stopped haunting her. It was an event, says Anne Klaus, that made it feel like the boundaries around your life had tightened. She laments that the story faded into the past and believes it should be remembered. Perhaps one day someone at McMaster will suggest a memorial on campus paying homage to Adela Komorowski and what she represented then and now. With files from the Hamilton Spectator and Hamilton Magazine. Thank you for listening. I'm Jay Nickel of the Nickel Investigations. 
And please consider subscribing to Ontario Cold Cases, a podcast on Patreon, Spotify, YouTube, or Apple Podcasts.